The inquiry into foreign interference heard hours of testimony this week, and among the revelations we learned, India and Pakistan attempted to interfere in Canada's last two elections, according to newly revealed intelligence documents. We have detected and reported on some foreign interference activities during those elections. However, the that the head of CSIS issued a burn notice for an intelligence report after meeting with the Prime Minister's top security advisor. Earlier in the week, former Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole said foreign interference may have cost his party as much as nine seats in the 2021 election. Nowhere near enough to change the results of the, the election, but um, for people in those seats, if they were undergoing uh, intimidation or suppression measures, their, their democratic rights were, were being trampled on by, by foreign actors. So the goal of this inquiry is to examine possible meddling by China, India, Russia and others in the 2019 and 2021 federal elections. And here to help us digest this week is former CSIS director Ward Elcock. Ward Elcock, good to see you again. Pleasure. We, we learned about these interventions made by foreign state actors, India using proxies in undisclosed ways, China trying to get money into the system to help uh, uh, you know, further the interests of people yes. who might support China. Are we any further ahead in understanding the extent of the interference uh, happening here? Um, no, I don't think most Canadians are much further ahead. Whether the commissioner is or not depends on... Uh, she's got, she's got act more access to information than, mm -hmm. than most do, so she may have a, she may have a different view and, and make, we may learn she has a different view. I don't think we know very much more about foreign interference than we did before. I'm not sure that we really have seen any indication of serious uh, foreign interference that affected the elections. Although the issue of foreign interference is clearly a, an important issue for a lot of Canadians. Right. So the, like, we should parse that a bit because there is the issue of foreign interference. We've heard from diaspora communities feeling pressure in their communities to just do certain things, having economic consequences for them and social consequences for them. And then there's the meddling in, in the electoral process. Yes. And, and my sense of it is that we've seen definite evidence it's happening. Uh, it's being attempted. But I've not yet seen something definitive, and I'm not trying to downplay the significance of saying this action had this political consequence and changed these results. What's your sense of what we've seen? It's not clear that any of the actions that any of the players have, have taken so far have really influenced any particular election and necess not necessarily any particular riding. Uh, Mr. O'Toole made the case that he'd lost nine seats as a consequence of, of foreign interference. I'm sure he believes that, um, and he has a rationale for it. He, he, he tried to explain it. Uh, but the reality is it depends on a, on a, on a bunch of, uh, of assumptions that I'm not sure are entirely accurate in terms of what the Chinese community did or didn't mm -hmm. do in terms of the election and why it voted and didn't vote. So, so there's a couple of things we've seen, though, that, that show the extent of the attempt uh, at minimum, right, whether the outcome was affected or not. Like we saw a document presented. Yes, relatively minimal interference, if, 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 if relatively minor in, in actions, if you will. Okay, so one of those, uh, maybe this is minor, I, I don't know, but the, there's some suggestion or the evidence, intelligence suggesting, sorry, uh, Chinese officials may have transferred $250,000 to threat actors in Canada to try to affect up to 11 campaigns, work with a, a bunch of different uh, staffers and volunteers working on these campaigns. What, what do you make of this revelation that Chinese money was coming in in some way? It does, there's no definitive proof it went to the campaigns, but it was put into the system somehow to try to influence outcomes. Well, I don't think it's actually clear how much was put in or whether any was in fact put in. Mm -hmm. uh, it, all of this is, uh, there is a, a, one of the, I think it was a conservative uh, political activist said at one point, we never get, it, in all the discussions we had about foreign interference, we never got any actionable intelligence. Right. Clearly in this case, even in this case, although there is the reporting on this, there's not necessarily any actionable intelligence that allows you to say X got this much and Y got that much and so on and so forth. I guess the other point I'd make is $250,000 spread across God knows how many ridings probably doesn't go very far or buy very much. Um, mm. it's, it's, it's a pretty small effort. I'm not saying it's acceptable, it's not. Yeah. Uh, and is it something that we should be working against? Yes. But did it affect the election? It doesn't appear that it did. There's a couple of things we've also heard. Uh, one is uh, what David Vigneault was talking about there, the, the current head of CSIS, about this burn notice, this recall uh, of an intelligence analysis uh, that they, they issued um, that he pulled back. And this was after a conversation with a national security advisor in the prime minister's office. 
there's no suggestion of anything wrong happening there, but there's been some suspicion. People looking at this saying, what exactly does this mean? I mean, you have been in that chair. You've been a CSIS director. How common is it to issue something, a recall like that, and a burn notice? And, and would a conversation with a prime minister or advisor uh, affect your decision making on that? No, it wouldn't. Uh, it wouldn't affect. It certainly wouldn't have affected mine, and I doubt very much it aff would affect uh, David's uh, mm -hmm. view of the world either. Um, uh, that's the, that's not the nature of the job. Um, I think the reality is bur burn notices are not necessarily all that common, but they're not uncommon. I think, as somebody said in in the course of the proceedings, those things happen. Um, a lot of an analytical product is produced by CSIS. Right. Um, it's produced at a certain level and it's produced in a kind of continuous stream. So, yet is it is it all going through an assessment by more senior people all the way all the way through? Yes, of course it is. Mm -hmm. But when it gets out into a wider community and you have other information and other circumstances, I've seen cases in the past where the information that CSIS has is not actually sufficient to justify the assumption that was made in the analytical piece, and we've had to go back and, and revisit it. So it's not, th this isn't untoward at all. So it, it, it's uh, uncommon, but it's not unusual no. for something like this to happen? No. Okay. Uh, so one thing we also learned is the role of this, this committee of senior civil servants that has been established to sort of deal with foreign interference during the writ period, the site committee as it's known. And we've seen the, the issues of, of Chinese uh, language social media such as WeChat being used to target the conservatives primarily. Kenny Chu has complained about this, Aaron O'Toole has complained about this saying it was damaging to their campaigns. The Officials overseeing that chose not to take action on that or issue a warning on that because they felt it was contained and didn't necessarily have proven foreign acting uh, motivations behind it, and it may not influence the outcome of the election. We saw today, though, that they did reach out to Facebook to take down a defamatory false story about Prime Minister Justin Trudeau during the election campaign because it was in English, could go viral, and in their view could affect uh, the outcome of the election. There's complex risk calculations going on in both of those. H how do you think what we've learned there shows how the country is dealing with this and, and what they might need to do in terms of uh, assessing these sorts of actions in the future? Well, perhaps we'll get something from the commissioner on that that mm. will be useful. Time will tell. I'm not so sure, but we'll see. Um, I think the reality is, and you can see it in the discussions around the, the, uh, the 2019 election, the 2021 election, yeah. there's a development in terms of how the bureaucrats are approaching the problem mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how, to some extent, they're trying to deal with the parties. So this is a learning experience. It didn't exist in my day with, that we didn't have any right. conversations at all with anybody. Um, uh, so it's a learning experience. And this is not easy stuff. Because as one of the conservatives, as I said earlier, one of the conservative uh, people who was interviewed by the commission said a lot of what we heard was not actionable. Well, the reality is if it was actionable, probably the RCMP would have taken action. Right. Or CSIS would have taken action to prevent the activity or to interfere with the activity. And that would have been the end of it. And you wouldn't have had. So basically what CSIS and, and the other intelligence agencies have is some information that allows them to, as they said, tell the conservatives or the liberals or the NDP or, or whichever party it is that some things are happening. We think some things are happening. If you see these things, talk to us. And in some sense, until that dialogue becomes more accepted and, and more common, yeah. and I suspect the political parties are just as leery about talking to the bureaucrats about what they're doing as the bureaucrats are about talking to them about classified information, uh, until that dialogue actually takes place, there's not going to be much of an ex a really fulsome exchange between right. the political parties and, and, and the government officials. There, there's one last thing I need to ask you about. Uh, there, there was reporting at the height of this. You, that about uh, from from global news primarily that Handong uh, urged China to not release the Michaels um, was, was the allegation that was published because uh, it would it would keep detaining them or releasing them would, would be politically injurious to the liberals and other reporting that this two hundred and fifty thousand dollars was used to finance uh, specific campaigns we saw intelligence summaries on both of those issues released 
that say, yes, the Michaels were discussed, but not necessarily in this way. We say, yes, the money was sent to Canada, but it didn't necessarily go to campaigns. How do we reconcile this? There's limits on what reporters can do uh, on national security issues, and there's limits of what conclusions we can draw from intelligence summaries, because you're not seeing the raw stuff. How do we reconcile the extent of all of this with such incomplete sort of issues? Well, well, one of the problems we're dealing with here is that a lot of the initial reporting and there have been a number of comments on that by people, well, for example, David Johnson, who said some of the reporting was not, in fact, accurate. So some of the stuff that reporters have seen at some point that purported to be the real thing was not the real thing. Mm -hmm. And so, in some sense, that, but that, that conditions everything that came afterwards, and we all think that what first came out is still, is still true, even if somebody has said it's not right. really true. Uh, that makes it very complicated, um, and I'm not sure it's going to be easy to resolve it. it. It leaves a lot of questions in people's minds. All right, Ward Elcock, all of this is complicated. Former CSIS Director Ward Elcock, thanks so much for your time. A pleasure.